Hello, hello everyone. Thank you. I just want to take a moment to um, say thank you to, to you, the viewer, the person who has decided to hop into this video and spend some time with me, spend some time with us. The Artful Leader interview series is really designed to support you, the person who is working with young people, to prioritize your own well-being so that you can lead with a full tank and so that you can be a part of a culture of community care and you know build the kind of relationships with your colleagues that are really healthy and build healthy relationships with your students and have a thriving organization in, in all ways and so on this podcast we're looking at so many different topics that relate to the health and wellness of folks working in education and youth development and how do we lead artfully in that process um, my background is in expressive arts therapy so i have a, a deep root in the arts and that is always expressed in some way in this conversation and i just want to thank you so much for taking the time to to tend to these topics of of youth development education arts, healing, um, social justice, and, and all the things that relate to that. And I want to invite you, um, as you're watching this, leave us some comments on what you're loving that you're hearing, or what are some further questions that you have, or what are other topics that you're grappling with so that we can really engage in topics that are meaningful to you in this conversation. And um, share it. If you'd like to be a part of this conversation, reach out to me, or if you know an artful leader that has a story or some wisdom to share in this arena, you know, connect them to me. I'm always looking for people to sort of map out as resources as we do this work and we, we build a community of, of, of care, of practitioners together. Um, so, you know, today our topic is one that I think hits all of us in our lives in some way. But I think that especially over the last 20 months, it is just so alive for everyone that I'm talking to, and that is grief. And, you know, I think in our lives, we have different experiences with grief, but over the past year, I mean, we have been just gobsmacked by loss in so many different ways. And, um, and that is why I have invited my dear friend and colleague, Jen Cormier, to come and join us. Um, Jen is a healing artist and a grief guide who's got 20 years of experience of walking people through all kinds of life transitions and she is doing some really powerful embodied nature and healing centered work um, to help folks walk through loss and um, so I'm just so excited to have you here today Jen thank you so much for being here. Wow, thank you, Rochelle, for that beautiful introduction. And the work you do is so important, really creating strong, healthy communities of care. And I really appreciate you. And thank you for having me on. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about you and some of the moments that we've shared in our friendship and in our learning journey as entrepreneurs together, and, and how one of the things that I love about how you work and how you live is by honoring rituals, right? And bringing sort of the senses and the body and the imagination and the heart um, into, into your life in these really meaningful ways. And one of the ways that I love to do that is through poetry. Mm -hmm. And I know you love poetry too, because I'm in your Facebook group and <laughs> I see your poems that you share. And it just felt apropos to, to begin our conversation with a kind of ritual. And um, I know you've got a little candle burning over there <laughs> that <laughs> folks can't see right now. And I've had incense going. And I feel like this is a topic that requires us to, to really pause in and take a sacred moment, you know, because this is, this is something we want to uh, be very tender with. So um, I chose a poem today that's called At the End of the Year, and it's from this beautiful book of blessings called Benedictus by John O'Donohue, who unfortunately passed away um, at a young age, but his, his words live on. And um, this poem really situates us in this timeline at the end of the year and how we acknowledge what we've gained, what we've lost in a really beautiful way. At the end of the year, 
The particular mind of the ocean, filling the coastline's longing with such brief harvest of elegant vanishing waves is like the mind of time opening the shapes of days. As this year draws to its end, we give thanks for the gifts it brought and how they became inlaid within where neither time nor tide can touch them. The days when the veil lifted and the soul could see delight when a quiver caressed the heart in sheer exuberance of being here. Surprises that came awake in forgotten corners of old fields where expectations seemed to have quenched. The slow brooding times when all was awkward and the wave in the mind pierced every sore with salt. The darkened days that stopped the confidence of the dawn. Days when beloved faces shone brighter with light from beyond themselves and from the granite of some secret sorrow, a stream of buried tears loosened. We bless this year for all we learned, for all we loved and lost, and for the quiet way it brought us nearer to our invisible destination. Mm. There was something Beautiful. about that destination and, and walking that, that just made me think of you and, um, and what you're doing to support those with grief. So why don't you introduce yourself and just share a little bit about who you are and, you know, how you came to do work with grief. Mm. Well, thank you for that poem. It was really rich. And I, I spend a lot of time at the ocean and mm -hmm. walking at the ocean and there's something about about walking um you know that's the my website uh name and podcast name are, are walk through grief with grace and i think that that walking that perpetual movement toward a destination we don't really know what that destination is right we can walk we can have an intention to walk toward connection toward more peace toward more lightness but we we never really fully arrive right like our whole life is a becoming and when we can see loss and grief as part of this natural cycle we can release some of the extra suffering that we might put on top of our loss when we are gripping and when we are frozen. So that just felt important to speak to that. It seemed like it, it, it went with the poem that you chose. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we both share this, this um, background of coming from an embodied place and a creative place. So for me, I think that that's, that that's an important lens, you know, as humans to, to look at our loss and our grief and our mourning through, um, you know, that everybody's individual, we're all going to unfold, you know, in a different way around, you know, no loss is the same, no person's process is going to be the same. So just, just knowing that there's no way to do it right. And there's no way to do it wrong yeah. <laughs> that really it's about just welcoming what is in front of us and being with it and walking with it and allowing our experience to be um, a teacher to us. Mm. And if we can stay in this curious place, right, that, that young people live in, that, that we are in when we're creative and we're creating that sort of space of curiosity, if we can approach our loss and our grief from that curious place, yeah. there can be gifts there for us. Yeah. 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 That's so powerful. Um, as I feel like we live in a society and especially in a lot of educational settings where it's kind of like, or in professional settings where it's like, Oh, here's the little square of how we're allowed to show up here. <laughs> oh, no hard feelings. Oh, you know, like, whoops, let's all keep it all together. And, 
it numbs us from so much learning and so much connection that could be happening if we just allowed for these things to flow through, right? And so I just appreciate that embodied approach that you're taking to this. So you, um, you know, you mentioned your website and your podcast, and I know you have a program. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your, you have a year long um, immersion program, right? Where you're working with folks who've experienced different losses. Tell me, tell us a little bit about that. And what does that look like? Yeah, I have, I have clients that um, have found me because, um, you know, maybe they had gone through um, some talk therapy and it wasn't quite enough or it wasn't a good match for them, or they just felt like, you know, I need to be in, in a, a little more of a holistic container to be with my grief. Um, because I think sharing story is such good medicine um, and being heard is so essential um, in our grief process. And often that's not enough. You know, it's, it's very cognitive and it lives up here. And we really, you know, our lived experience really expresses itself in our tissues in our bodies and when we have gone through something challenging you know a trauma a loss a death something like this it really is in our body and we need to be in relationship not just to our mental layer but to our physical being to our emotional self to our spirit you know we are these multi-dimensional beings and to think we could just use our words and that would be enough, um, you know, it's just often not the case. So yeah. the clients that find me really are ones that, that are a little more creative, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they do, they do want to approach their grief in a, in a way that um, is in community mm -hmm. and is multidimensional. So yeah, my, my program brings in, um, it, it really is holistic and it brings in all of all of those layers and we um, we practice over time over the course of four seasons we practice how to soften into what is because what happens in the grieving process is we come up against some pain and often we want to take it and like you said put it in the box over here with you know hard feelings and <laughs> I can't quite I can't deal with this now and um and it gets shoved down in a way yeah. so what happens then is then we're 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 creating suffering on top of the pain that is there so even though it seems a little paradoxical when we can, when we can soften into the pain that is there and say, okay, Hey, I see you. <laughs> You're welcome here. What happens is then there's a softening, there's some movement, there's some allowing for what is, mm -hmm. and then that can move. And it just opens up the channel of, of life force energy, right. Of creative energy. And when we, you know, we don't stay in that painful, dark place. Right. It feels like, oh, if I touch into that heavy place or that dark place, it's going to stay there forever. But it doesn't. It, you know, we can only experience one emotion for so long. So right. that will shift and move. And once we open up to the energy and let it move, what comes next is creative life force happens. And there's gratitude under there. There's, you know, there's love under there. There's all of these other layers under there that aren't that monotone mm -hmm. black and white that we can often think in our culture oh that's the hard box that's painful grief death let's put that over here and then we have our happy box that's anything graduation and wedding and you know we want babies. these things. babies <laughs> like should all be here these and really when we when we when we when we sink into it we realize wow even the things that are supposed to be happy yeah. like babies and graduation and marriage right. often there's a grief process in those because it's a letting go of 
oh my gosh, you know, there's so much postpartum depression after women have babies because they don't have community support or they're letting go of their freedom, you know, because freedom is a a human with two arms and two legs that are no longer yours (laughs) because they're now attached to a small beak. So there's, there's grief in that. So when we realize that the joy and the celebration and the grief are all woven together and we allow for that, we realize, oh, wow, there's, there's some really grief that moves through, through these quote unquote, happier transitional moments and every day. So I think that's the, that's the invitation that I offer my clients is how can we circling back around to the ritual that you spoke of, how can we create for ourselves some daily creative rituals that work for us as individuals into our morning or into our evening or into our week or on our Sunday or Friday or something where we can take an action, a creative action to express a letting go, Mm -hmm. you know, and really weave in creatively letting go Mm -hmm. into our weeks and into our days. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to name right now, and this was not on our script, (laughs) (laughs) Um, which is what I love about just going live is um, one of the moments that, that I spent with you. And we've done this a couple of times together is that ritual that you have of, you know, you build an altar every week with flowers and different things on your, just things that are, you know, you can say more about that, but then you take all those flowers and you sort of like release them into the ocean at the end of every week at sunset. And I've, I've joined you, um, in that process a number of times and stood there at sunset and watched the flowers float away and, and just like placed all of those wishes and all of those, whatever it is that I want to let go of or release into those flowers and let them go. And, and I feel like people don't, I love that you said something about talk therapy and this isn't to bash talk therapy in any way, but what is healing is an activation of our nervous system and an activation of our senses, not necessarily just talking. And so, and I, and I feel like the reason why I want to pinpoint this is because a lot of the folks that watch these interviews are not necessarily clinicians they're artists they're creatives they're teachers they're administrators who might be a little bit overwhelmed by the mental health components of grief and think well i'm not a counselor or uh, how you know i don't want to open up these big conversations with my kids and i don't Mm -hmm. know how to handle all that story content and i think the reason why i bring your ritual to mind and I kind of pin it here in this conversation is because these actions that we do with our bodies are so powerful. And just, you know, and I think like in the Mexican culture that we live so close to here on the borderlands is like Dia de los Muertos and that whole ritual around, you know, thinking of our ancestors and interacting with those who have left us and and those kind of creating those kinds of physical tactile processes for students for staff are so powerful you don't have to get into the whole story and just doing these small rituals that connect to the earth that connect to nature that connect to our bodies and allow us to conceptualize or imagine you know we're using our imagination when we're doing that right we're saying i'm putting all of my sorrows into this flower and then the flower is going to go float away into the ocean or whatever but those kinds of processes are so helpful so i just i just wanted to name that as something that i've experienced just just as a friend spending time with you i can imagine folks who are working with you in a more um deliberate way with a specific goal in mind are, are, are getting a real treat working with you. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for putting, you know, thank you for highlighting that. And, um, and I could imagine, right. The, the, the overwhelm or the, the resistance or the hesitation maybe mm-hmm. for folks who are educators or artists and, and, and do feel like, Ooh, I don't want to touch that grief. Like that's over here in the health and 
<laughs> like right. the therapy right realm, but to just acknowledge that if we're human, you know, as human beings, no one is untouched by loss and grief. You know, if anyone says to me, oh yeah, I don't need to join your group. I don't have any loss or I don't have any grief. I'm just like, <laughs> wow. Okay. You know, so, so tell what? me your secret <laughs> this is magic potion of zero loss so i mean if we're alive and we're living there are seasons of you know growth life death right and it, there's cycles so acknowledging that is yeah our i think our soul recognizes the truth of that and it's we create our own suffering when we try to deny that we have cycles of loss and death yeah. in our lives because we lose things all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be death. It could be, Oh, I, um, my child is no longer, you know, a little kid. They've moved on to the next fate. Now they're an adolescent and that can be celebrated and ritualized and wow now you're a teenager but now I've what happened <laughs> to my kid my little kid you know so there's a grief in a lot loss of childhood now you know I've I did a, I, I worked with a uh, a girl who was becoming a big sister and mm -hmm. she had it, it just like there's a new baby in the family and we're we're all celebrating and focusing on the baby but she she was losing her only childness. Yeah. You know, when she was becoming an older sister, it's like, I'm stepping into this role of big sister and everyone's like, woohoo, big sister. And she's like, oh, you know, so acknowledging yeah. that, you know, oh, this is, this is like a loss of this mm -hmm. and a threshold and a stepping into that. So whenever there's a new phase and we're stepping across a doorway into a new chapter, there's the completion of the previous chapter so yeah. just you know I think seeing it that way mm -hmm. it, it turns it into a little more oh this is like an everyday human experience and just just seeing it from that lens anytime we can give ourselves or our community or the students we work with an opportunity to express a letting go that's powerful and that can be simple and that can be really healing. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that because in one, one of the things that I always advocate for is to have these practices like you build with your clients, just have these practices on a regular basis so that the small, tiny grief gets a place to be acknowledged and then when the bigger you know waves like in the poem it talks about those waves that like fill every sore with salt you know those things that come through that are so painful and so difficult then you have some you have some skill around holding that and you have some practices around like oh we get in a circle and we check in and we talk or we leave a little object in the circle or we pass something around, you know, like just things that you can do with kids and teens to weave those natural cycles of joy and loss. Um, I have a friend who runs a really cool program for young people called Arts Amplifying Youth. And one mm -hmm. of the things that they do in their group as they check in is what's what they call it shitty and litty <laughs> <laughs> I and they're like what's the shitty thing and what's the litty thing you know <laughs> and, and everybody gets a chance to share like something that was shitty and something that was super lit that week that they could talk about and and those kinds of rituals i think are so important for folks holding space for for children and young people regardless of what your role is just allowing that space for those natural rhythms and those like human experiences to to be a part of the space and obviously there might be things that get expressed that a educator doesn't have tools to really walk a young person through the whole story or all the emotions that come through and that's why you need school therapists and social workers and all those people to really address those but i always like to make sure that folks walk away from these conversations feeling like they have some tools like something that you can do to to create a healing space for young people yeah yeah any other thoughts that you have about 
I feel like it's kind of like a two pronged question that I want to throw out here for us to just kind of riff off of. It's like, Mm -hmm. on one hand, as, as adults, as parents, as teachers, as teaching artists, as you know, whatever it is that we're doing and we're confronted with our own losses so often. And how do we show up in a professional space? Um, and be vulnerable and real about that without it like throwing us sideways. And then how do we, you know, we talked a little bit about holding space for young people, but like, what are so your ideas about how adults can, you know, get out of that little box when, when you're going to work and when you're interacting with others, any ideas about that? Yeah. You know, I think, whatever we cultivate as individuals, if we're leaders in a classroom or in a community, um, we can allow that to spill over Mm -hmm. into our leadership. So the more we take care of ourselves, the more we put rituals that allow us to shed what we don't need into our day and our week, the more we can be that when we show up as a leader. So I think it starts with, it always starts with us yeah. as leaders, um, filling our cup and, and really caring for ourselves, um, finding that support that we need, those communities that hold us where we don't have to be the leader, right? right. Where, where we are just one of the ones being held in a container. Yeah. And then from that place, when we show up we have the strength and the fortification and the capacity to then also be vulnerable, right? As a leader and show a little bit. I mean, I think about the teachers and the folks who um, were the most powerful in my life. They showed me a little bit of who they were, right? You know, they, they were a real person. They weren't just the teacher on the pedestal, but they were real. And that realness came from a sense of vulnerability. You know, maybe there was a share of this was hard in my life, right? To let this go, or there was this. And then, you know, we learn from that modeling as community members or as children or, or teens. Yeah. We learn from that and learn, oh, wow, you know, that was hard. And they even shared that. And, yeah. you know, oh, like maybe I could share now that thing that I just let go of because yeah. this leader in my space is doing that. So I think it's leading really by example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love so many of the things that you said, and those are all things that I really teach the folks that I work with. You know, you've got to have your own sort of nervous system regulation tools on board and your own healing. And, and, and it's something you get to do. It's a privilege. It's, it's, it's something, it's not like, oh, you have to, but it, like you, you get to do that, you know, because you're worthy, you're worth it. And your well being is worth it. And then you get to share that with others. And, and then you also get to be in communities where you are held and, um, and where you don't have to lead and where you can just be a vulnerable person. And I think, you know, when we share vulnerably as leaders with young people or, or kids or, or team members that we're supervising or whatever, it doesn't just give them permission to share, but it also, like you said, role models, you know, it really sets an example of like, oh, this is how, this is a way through. This is a way I could make it through also. And I think that builds trust. And I I work with a lot of people who ask questions like, well, what do I do when I'm working with a student that I know is dealing with mental health issues? I don't, you know, and and some people kind of tend to want to like badger kids like, hey, what's going on with you? Talk to me or whatever. But I think one of the most powerful things you can do is share your own grief share your own experiences and and or talk to them about things you're doing about the stressors that you have and that builds trust because now they're like oh this is a real person yeah this is a real person i can trust and if you just communicate with students in a way or with colleagues in a way that's like my door is always open yeah you know or there's always this space 
in our class where we're going to circle at some point or we're going to share or, you know, so that there's always these entry points that they can step into if they want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the more consistent you are with showing up for yourself and showing up for the community, the more they're going to want to step into that and take advantage of, of the juiciness of what you're offering, you know. Absolutely. It's yeah. So, so beautiful. Yeah. One point. So, um, I know you've got some, um, exciting things that are coming up that I want to make sure that we got right, another pin. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, you've got a podcast. Yes. Of, yes. Yes. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? Well, Tell us a little bit about that. And you've thought so deeply about all the different components you want to include in this and make it a really rich listening experience for folks. So tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Yeah, it's a long time coming. And uh, I, I had to work through a lot of fear around, you know, visibility and, it, you know, I'm going to be on Apple and Spotify and anyone can find it. Yeah. So I had to work through a lot of those bits myself. And, um, but it's, you know, it's just a thing that's been nudging me because um, I think that it's, it's so valuable for people to be able to hear themselves and their story reflected in others. Yeah. You know, that's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Yeah. And when we can listen I really think listening is, is a sacred act. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, when we listen wholeheartedly, there's so much that we can receive. And that's really what a podcast is, right? It's, it's, it's listening. And there's some, you know, there's some conversations we can multitask and do the dishes and work out or whatever we're doing and listen to the podcast. Um, but when we listen to other stories, we can see, we can source some of our own inner wisdom. And exactly. we might see, we might have a particular way that we're kind of clamping down to our story of grief or our loss. Like, it's like this, I see it like this. And then we hear someone else talk about job loss or the loss of their parent or, you know, some kind of loss or grief. And we, we suddenly see our life or our story from a new perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be so healing to just see it in a new light. Yeah. So that's one, one thing that I want to bring to the table um, by putting these interviews out there, which is something I think that you do so beautifully, right? Is bring different perspectives on leadership and creativity and, mm -hmm. you know, so, so bringing those conversations to the table and then also offering up, um, Every seventh episode is going to be uh, an opportunity for folks to just relax and reset their nervous system mm -hmm. and receive. So um, as opposed to just your traditional podcast listening, there'll be, I'll, I'll be leading these or a guest will be leading these, but mm -hmm. um, a guided visualization, a guided relaxation, a yoga nidra, a meditation, something where you can just close your eyes cozy up under a blanket or outside yeah. under a tree mm -hmm. and really relax and receive. Mm. And this is just so important to do that on a regular basis. Like we're talking about these, what is the rituals that we can do to really yeah. fill ourselves up and show up fully. Yeah. So I wanted to offer something like that on this podcast because it's audio on a regular basis. So people could listen to episode seven, 14, you know, 21 and go, okay, I just need to recharge and yeah. I can receive that in this space. So I'm really excited about that. And, um, the first, the seventh episode is, is an ancestor meditation where we can really receive the support that we can't see and imagine all of these ancestors. I think that we get a little bit caught up in, in, I know trauma is really, um, you know, it's, it's up right now and, and yeah. people are really wow. like, yeah, really, um, leaning into, Oh, yeah. wow. It might not be that I'm an alcoholic. It might be that I had trauma. Right. And I, I love all the work that's happening and all the conversations that are happening around trauma. 
And I think it's easy to get into sort of the dark and deep, which it's, it's important to go into the dark and deep, but to see, oh, oh my gosh, look at all the ancestral trauma, you know, that's been passed yeah. down from my ancestors. So valuable. And we also have ancestors that they were the survivors and they yeah. had wishes and prayers for their next generations to yeah. be leaders and artists and teachers. And here we are. Yeah. Artists and teachers and leaders. And that there's that there's a, a generational celebration as yeah. well around our survival, around our living and loving. And that that we could sit into a space so that that, that first meditation is really coming into a central place and imagining mm. seven generations back of ancestors celebrating us and offering us their wisdom and offering us their love and offering us their support. So it's a 30 minute meditation of that, where we can just mm. relax into what support is there. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is so vital for us to do on the everyday. What, what, supports are there for me seen unseen oh, i've got gravity i've got the earth supporting me right i've got my breath supporting me i've got you know maybe my great great grandmother's like out there rooting for me you know and offering support so just really opening yeah. up you know in a creative way how we can see mm -hmm. that we are supported and how we can receive mm -hmm. that support mm -hmm. so that's that's my wish for this podcast. And I think it's coming, mm -hmm. um, it's coming through in a really beautiful, a beautiful way. So. Sounds like it. So what is it called and when does it drop? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's called walk through grief with grace. So walk through grief with grace and it drops at, uh, basically midnight on, um, November 15th, which is next Monday in a week, ah! one week from today. And November 15th felt like a really powerful day because that's the ninth anniversary of my father's death. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got me into this work mm -hmm. is, is being with him through his cancer journey, his death, walking with my grief for a year after he died. And that's what has been percolating and slowly walked me into doing grief work. So I'm honoring him um, by launching this podcast on that day. Wow, that's just beautiful. And I can't wait to hear it. And I can't wait to get your advice on how to transform the Artful Leaders interview series into an audio series as well. It's been one of my dreams as well. But yeah, so if you're listening, I'm gonna put some links in the comments here so that you can find Jen's work. You can find her Facebook group. She's got an awesome group where she's engaging folks who are experiencing grief in all kinds of ways. And then um, you'll be able to listen to this beautiful podcast. And then you've also got um, some kind of like series, like a free live workshop series, right? That's coming up soon. Yeah. What's, what's the deal on that. Yeah. You know, usually I like to offer some free virtual events mm -hmm. for folks um, around the holidays because often the holiday season can be challenging because there, uh, there are family rituals that might happen. Oh, we used to always watch football on Thanksgiving day or, you know, <laughs> yeah. right. So um, over the Thanksgiving week, um, November 24th, through that's uh, Wednesday, November 24th through Sunday, November 28th. I'm offering a, a five day virtual retreat for folks who are moving through any kind of grief and loss. Mm -hmm. And it's called five steps to walk through grief with gratitude. Mm. And gratitude might feel completely foreign when we're moving through an acute loss, because it's like, how can I be grateful yeah. when I just lost this thing? And, you know, gratitude is such a, uh, you know, cultural, uh, cornucopia, right. Where it's sort of held in this, in this, uh, stream of gratitude around Thanksgiving, whether or not you celebrate Thanksgiving, but often people have a long weekend off and there are some family traditions around that weekend. And even if folks are 
around family members, they can still feel isolated if they've had a loss and feel like, oh, you know, but people don't understand me. So it's an invitation for folks to hop on um, that it's an hour and a half every day for five days. Mm -hmm. And you can come on for all the days or for a few of the days mm -hmm. and receive some grounding. I'll offer a tool every day, a practice that you can decide you want to take and do in your life, like the rituals we're talking about. So I'll offer one per day um, to move into a, into more connection, into a little more peace. Um, and and then you'll meet some other folks on there who are going through sort of a depth of experience around some kind of grief as well. So there's some community building um, around that five day format as well. So mm -hmm. if anyone is listening, we can pop the, the um, Eventbrite. It's a free event and I've got a, a, an event, Eventbrite link. Okay. Folks can register for that for the Thanksgiving week if they are needing some more support than just listening to a podcast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I know there are so many people in my community. I'm talking to you. <laughs> I have heard from so many of you that you've lost parents, you've lost loved ones, you've had such difficulty over the past, you know, just during the pandemic. And before that, when we just were kind of like on a more, you know, steady stream of life cycles. Um, so take advantage of these resources. This is really going to support you um, and, and reach out to me or Jen if you want more information. I'll put all the links here and we'll have that available in, the, in this group. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. I think that's going to be beautiful. Um, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up our conversation, I feel like we could talk forever and you know, good. <laughs> um, but um, I have a couple of questions that I usually ask my artful leaders at the end of these conversations. And, and one of them, and I know we've, we've hinted at these things a little bit, but what are your sort of self-care rituals or practices that you lean into on a daily, weekly, regular basis? Yeah. So, you know, these shift over time because I go through different sort of cycles of life and, and seasons. But right now, one thing that I'm leaning into is um, really leading with, with offering. So um, I think that in this time where I'm I, I, I'm seeing offering as an opportunity to step into a sacred reciprocity, mm. right? With, with, with energy, with life force, right? And mm. so I have, um, I've slowly been expanding an ancestor altar that, that I started um, mm. maybe last year and it's got a sculpture now and it's all flowers and there's you know, photos that are framed of my ancestors and objects from my, you know, my grandfather's bolo tie and my friend's it's ashes. Like you're looking at it, do you want to show I'm, it to us? Or is that... at, well, let's see if I can show it to you. Um, if you want to. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I can show it to you, but let's, let's, let's see if I can. Mm -hmm. There's some flowers yeah. and there's all kinds of, it's hard to, to see yeah, the lighting. Yeah, no, we so can great. see it. Yeah. But, um, you know, and I put out, I have these great, um, like here, I'll actually bring it into the light over here. Cause I do have this, there's no lighting over there, which is tricky, but I've got this little, you know, ancestor, um, plate of food that, you know, I had a teacher years and years ago suggest that I start like a little ancestor plate of food for my dad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took me, I don't know, seven years to actually start doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that we, that we get seeds planted, you know, somebody suggests something and sometimes it takes a long time for us to be ready to do the thing. So now, you know, um, every day I'm putting out, like I put coffee in this little, you know, special Fancy. cup. I, I sent these to all of my clients, you know, to, to, to use on their altars if they want. It's like little, um, juice from the farmer's market. So just making offerings um, to, to, you know, what I can't see, to my ancestors. And I bring flowers outside every, every day mm -hmm. and just offer them up um, and, you know, blow into them 
my gratitude, my love, just offering, you know, my work in the world, um, you know, just, just giving it back. And, um, so, so that's something that that's been a daily practice, um, a medit meditation practice, a little bit of breath work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's heartier, longer, sometimes it's shorter, 12 minutes, you know, a little yeah. bit of yin yoga, right? So just weaving in yeah. some attention to my physical body, to my breath every day. Um, and, and sometimes that looks like a kind of traditional yoga practice at the beginning of the day. And sometimes it's like, while my kid is playing in the tennis court, you know, I sit down and I do, I do so, you know, so being creative and flexible with those kinds of things is really um, beneficial. So I think that that's really important to like, see, okay, well, where am I? Like when my son was an infant, I had had this really extensive meditation practice. And then I have this infant and I had my teacher say, well, now it's a breastfeeding meditation. That's just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're not going to go sit on your meditation cushion and like open <laughs> out. Now you're breastfeeding. Like, so just, just, and now I've got a, I've got a six-year-old. So now it's okay. I do a little yin yoga while he's on a scooter, you know, <laughs> racing circles on tennis court. So just be <laughs> flexible with your life and where you are and yeah. what your needs are. So that's just sort of how my practice is weaving kind of into my, you know, where I am in my life right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that because especially for those of us who are parents, or, you know, or caretakers of others, like your spiritual practice or your self-care practice, just adjust. It's got, you can't, you can't beat yourself up for like not doing the thing. And I think that the real practice is how do I show up in the moment in that mode, you know? And so I love that. I can absolutely, you absolutely. Your kiddo, like while he's zooming around. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, love that. Um, and then my my last question that I always love to ask is, um, you know, what what's your message to educators? What what is something you really wish they all knew and could you know kind of tuck away right here as they leave this conversation today. Uh, you know, what's coming to me right now is um, around grief and loss that it's not about what you say mm. or saying the right thing. Mm. Um, it's about your being. It's about your beingness. So if you have a colleague, a family member, a student, someone who maybe just went through a, a loss, yeah. um, not worrying about saying the right thing, yeah. saying less and just being there, just feel yourself fully present mm -hmm. with them and just exuding the I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said earlier, my door is open. Mm -hmm. um, is so important. I've asked, you know, my community members in the grief and grace group a, a few different times about, you know, what were the most powerful words that people spoke to you when you went through a loss? And almost everyone said, you know, it wasn't the words. It was someone just showing up, just being there for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that that's something to surrender and relax into that you don't have to know the right protocol or say the right things it's just about softening into being a present heart with somebody and just saying hey i'm, I'm here for you my door is open mm -hmm. mm. Mm. love it yeah love it wise words wise words well i love you and we could talk forever yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who are watching can probably tell we have a friendship <laughs> outside of here. But um, thank you so much, Jen, for for kind of taking the sacred moment to to just hold grief in a different way with us. And um, and thank you for you who is listening and watching. For um, I just want to encourage you with whatever you're 
grappling with when it comes to loss or holding space for others. Um, you know, hopefully this conversation has nourished you and, um, and encouraged you and, and, and please do reach out if your organization is really struggling with this kind of stuff, this is the work that I do. Um, and if you as an individual want some support, Jen's got all these really great resources for you with, uh, walking through grief with grace. So we just wish you all the best and uh, we'll see you all next week for the next Artful Leader interview. Be well, Jen. I can't wait to see you in person. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was really rich for me. I appreciate you. Good. All right. Mwah.